Thanks for joining us on this beautiful Friday morning or evening if you're on the East Coast with Gabby. Um, so we have one of the most highly anticipated webinars today. Gabriella Krizantakis, AKA Feeding Wolves, is gonna go through her MetaHuman workflow um, using Facebook Studio, streaming real time into Unreal Engine. Um, most of us likely discovered her on YouTube or through one of her amazing Greek MetaHuman videos. So I'm really excited to have her here. Um, we have about 44 people attending now, but I am going to do a couple of quick introductions. Hi, everybody, and thank you, Karen. <laughs> uh, so I am a virtual production artist, and I am currently specializing with MetaHumans in motion capture. I started with nothing, and that's how most people start, with absolutely no experience in Unreal. I didn't even know what mocap was a year ago, and I uh, found out about virtual production. So I took Matt Workman's advice. I installed Unreal Engine, and I tried learning it. And the first two weeks, all I could find was gaming tutorials until <laughs> I finally stumbled on a video by Jonathan Wimbush. He had a video on how to recreate a Mars landscape using an HDRI taken from Mars. And uh, then I found out he had a course on MoGraph.com for Unreal. So that's how I got started. And for anyone who's kind of scared to learn Unreal, uh, I can't. I had just taken the um, Andrew Kramer Beginners After Effects. So that was like my first <laughs> experience ever. And um, from there, I started creating uh, content based on what I learned. And then I met with Manis, who sent me my first pair of mocap gloves. And then I reached out to Xens. I asked to test out their software. I pretty much lived off of trials. And then once I tested out Xens and I had the body and glove data working, I, I told Katie Joe at Xens, I was like, Katie Joe, I just saw Alita Battle Angel and the facial performance <laughs> is absolutely incredible. And can I do this? And she's like, well, you should probably talk to Facewear, which is how I was introduced to you. <laughs> and from there, I asked Katie Joe, I was like, so what do I do? What do I do? And she said to me, she's like, you can be using the best facial motion solution on the planet, but the actual performance, like 50% of it is also dependent on using a high quality rig. And at the time, the MetaHumans had not come out. So I tried using what I could find on Unreal Marketplace and failed miserably. So then the MetaHumans came out. And if anybody hasn't taken a look mm -hmm. at them, they are absolutely incredible. I mean, I am just, they have changed my life. They've changed my life. Being able to have access to these high quality rigs has just been, you know, um, incredible. So I decided to test out the MetaHumans with facewear, and I actually tested out UE LiveLink face first. And I had mentioned in my vlog, it was like my third vlog ever, that I would love to see what the facial performance would look like with facewear. And mm -hmm. your company listens to creatives. Like that is that is a rare thing is you actually listen. Well, thank you. <laughs> so I actually met with you and Josh and from there, Josh walked me through how to set up my first facial motion logic blueprint in Unreal with MetaHumans. And I, um, that was I my- I remember first. that. <laughs> and it, it was just, it was so much fun. So a little time has passed since then. I was extremely grateful to be accepted into the Unreal Engine Fellowship where I spent uh, five to six weeks completely immersing myself and being trained by, you know, Epic's uh, finest and learning all these pro tricks, which really helped me to start working cleaner and more organized. And then uh, for my fellowship, I asked if I could test out your indie head cam. Mm -hmm. And that was the first time I ever used an HMC. I didn't even know what HMC stood for. And I finally had like full body motion capture working and I used that in my fellowship submission, but I was just exploring facial motion and uh, the face control rig board. So after that, I got to participate as a teacher's assistant. And during that time, I started delving into the face control rig board. 
And for anyone who is interested in how I got started with where I am today with facial motion, I've probably watched the Adam Walton Unreal Engine face control rig video over a thousand times. And it takes me three to four days to actually go through the whole thing and keyframe everything. And that was like, that's the secret sauce that everybody's like, oh, what's your technique? So you got to spend some time on that face control rig board and play with it and learn that like your meta humans, not all expressions are created equal. Mm -hmm. So you might be working with Hudson, for example, uh, and you'll notice that his expressions, even though they're the exact same controls, will look slightly different than if you're working with Ada, who happens to be my absolute favorite. And test out your faces, test out the way the data looks with the face control rig board. It's incredible. So from there, I, um, I finally got access to the Mark IV HMC. Just recently, I actually got it uh, working with Xens and the Manus gloves. And the first test that I released, the facial motion test that I released, um, where I'll be showing it in a video that I have. One second, there's a, a biker gang driving by. Um, <laughs> was the first time that I learned how to hit record in Xens and it automatically hits record in Shepard, which is um, the actual hardware setup for this. It's the HMC. It's got um, a Teradec receiver, which communicates with this key pro, which then communicates with Shepard. And then Shepard can record it like on the key pro. But also you can connect all these together with Xsense. So you have this body and face mm -hmm. integration. So once you hit record, then you don't have to worry about syncing anything. So that's really what I've been spending a lot of time on is like, I'm like, wow, if I don't have to worry about syncing, I need to delve into dialogue. Yeah. And that is where uh, I believe Facework shines and the motion logic blueprint comes in because to do dialogue is not easy. If anybody has uh, tried it, it's not easy. So if anyone thinks I'm just like plugging stuff up and I'm like, oh, look, it's perfect. It's a lot of work. Yeah. but i'm obsessed with it and i i am always trying to learn new ways to improve my current workflow uh creating a profile is so important so um for now i, I yeah, that, that's, yeah that's so your ability to go from a clear beginner without any technical knowledge um it's kind of the dream here right we're trying to democratize these these tools make it easy for folks to pick it up but also um provide the resources out there for folks to be able to adopt learning a full performance capture whether they're starting with faceware or xsense or manis or any of the other mocap uh, solutions out there so for today we're gonna provide you all the resources you need to go through Gabby's workflow. And before we get started, she put together a quick video that I'm going to pause right now and we're gonna uh, dive right into it. Hi, I'm Gabriella and I go by Feeding Wolves. I am an all-in-engine virtual production artist specializing in motion capture with MetaHumans. I've been using Unreal Engine for a little over a year, entering this world without any experience in 3D applications and having been a bartender for the last decade. I am currently working on a short film in Unreal Engine in which the facial performance of my character is extremely important, especially with dialogue. The character I am using was originally created by Michael Weisheim. I had the face portion removed with the help of Blender artist Pixel Urge so that it could be replaced with a metahuman face. He also taught me how to customize the face textures in Substance Painter. The body textures were completely remodified by talented 3D character artist Daniel Kadina and the hands were re-rigged by character artist Constantine Lacrua. For all of the lighting, I received assistance from Bernard Ryder. For anyone that does not know what a metahuman is, it is a high fidelity, fully rigged character that can be created and customized in the metahuman creator. They can be accessed using Quixel Bridge and then easily imported into Unreal Engine, with all of this being completely free. Hi, I am a metahuman and I am fully rigged and ready for motion capture. I am made by Three Lateral and Epic Games. A ton of effort was put into making me look as realistic as possible. Look, look at my eyes, for example. They look super real. My experiments with facial motion performance began as in the story, my character speaks in Greek. 
she discovers a mirror image of herself. So the Greek metahuman was one of the first tests I did in order to try syncing audio with body and facial performance, as well as mirroring the movements. Okay, let's see. Ena, dio, tria, tesera, pede. <gasps> Alpha, vita. My current setup consists of the Mark IV HMC by Facewear, which streams in live RGB data into Facewear Studio and is recorded in Shepard. I'm also using the Xsense Link Suit to uh, animate this body oh, and the Manus Prime 2 gloves to animate the fingers. And then for the face, I am using the Mark IV Head Mountain Camera by Facewear, which is transmitting video data to uh, Facewear Studio, which is using the Live Client plugin by Glassbox to transmit this information into Unreal Engine. And oh yeah, all of this is being run on a Puget Systems workstation with an NVIDIA RTX A6000. And that's my phone, so I gotta go, bye. I'm able to integrate all of this data and record it while also streaming it directly into Unreal Engine by simply pressing record in one software, which then gives me two animation files, one for the face and one for the body. I then record my audio separately and will do something like a clap and open my eyes wide, using these as markers in order to sync everything up in sequencer later. The steps involved in setting up facial motion to work with MetaHumans and Facewear is simple and easy. With my MetaHuman imported into my Unreal Engine project, I enable the Live Client plugin by Glassbox. Or if you are working in 4.27, Facewear has a free LiveLink plugin now available. I then assign the Motion Logic Blueprint to the MetaHuman face. This Motion Logic Blueprint sits between the raw solver data from Facewear and the MetaHuman pose asset. And a special thank you goes to Norman Wang from Glassbox, as there are only a few people in this world that can tailor such an intricate Motion Logic Blueprint. This will give you the most natural looking expressions in combination with Facewear's tracking system and solver. I begin my facial motion workflow by first capturing ROMs, also known as range of motions, as this allows me to retarget my facial motion directly onto my MetaHuman so that I can make adjustments using the multiplier in Facewear Studio, and so that my expressions match up as close as possible to the MetaHuman I am using. And this is all done in real time. In this example, I show what the facial expressions look like with and without a profile. Once my expressions approximate my MetaHumans, then I stream in the actual performance. MetaHumans are heavy assets, which is why optimizing involves lowering LODs on the MetaHuman and paying attention to frame rates in Unreal so that no data is lost. Once my facial performance is captured, in Sequencer, I add my audio, the body and facial animation, and then using the sound of the clap, the wide eyes, and the clap itself as my markers, I sync everything up. Before I begin fine tuning the facial motion, I like going through all of the controls on the face control rig board of my MetaHuman. In the event that there are any areas that might need to be adjusted in the creator before continuing, I then bake my facial performance to the control rig and go through the performance looking for areas that might need adjusting. Since the MetaHumans have over a thousand bones and blend shapes, Facewear will get you 90% of the way there. But in order to fully utilize the face, I use an additive backward solver to add on top of my current animation. I'm currently learning how to use curves in order to smooth out any sort of jitter. And since I am new to working with curves, this is still a work in progress. I highly recommend you watch the video shared by Unreal Engine on the face control rig board featuring Adam Walton. And I also have a video library inspired by that video where I've organized all of the face control rig board controls using timestamps and go over the process of creating an additive backward solver. The next thing I am planning is moving my entire motion capture workflow with MetaHumans into Unreal Engine 5 so that I can redevelop my pipeline utilizing the new animation tools and also taking advantage of Lumen. This gives me an opportunity to see where the new features take my story and allow me to continue to learn. During the process of creating, that is when you learn the most. 
you find solutions to problems, and create new pipelines. As a virtual production artist, I am still learning. We have some questions coming in, but to kind of bring it all back, because there's so many components that we can touch on in your facial animation workflow. But let's bring it back to the beginning. Once you are done capturing or recording the performance, how long does it take to refine um, the animation tuning once you once you dive right into Facebook Studio? You mean the cleanup process? So the animation tuning, we have a question about after recording oh. performance, how long does it take to tune your animation to your character within Facebook Studio? Oh, you mean creating a profile? Okay, so yeah. all right. it's actually, it depends. It really depends. So if you're doing facial expressions like emotion and things like that, um, not very long. And yeah. if you're doing dialogue, you really, it depends on how you operate. So what I do, depending on each take that I'm doing, let's say I'm just doing like that end scene where it was just like emotions. Um, I do a few ROMs before that actual performance. I get a few neutral poses where like I just do my face completely still. I do a few versions of that. So, and I keep note of where my calibrations are. So I do take a lot of notes. And I test out various calibrations first. And then I might test using either the uh, professional head cam solver, the tracker, or the webcam one. And then I start looking at like how it's coming in on my MetaHuman, if there's like a few breaks in certain areas. So really it's, it depends on the data you're working with. Mm -hmm. It just depends on the data. Sometimes like if I'm recording with like a DSLR data that I captured of my face, it might be like overexposed or uh, something. So you really need to spend a little bit of extra time if you are going to get the best possible data and doing a ROM before every uh, performance because you might have your face positioned a little different um, from one session to another. And uh, if there's head movement, I might want to redo it. But you want to go through everything. You want to do enough ROMs, like you want to go through the eyebrows, you want to go through like the, the mouth area, you want to do the eyes, maybe do like the nose. Um, <laughs> and you want to make sure you touch on all parts of the face so that when you do finally stream in your data, you have like, you know, nailed it. And what's great is that you can do this, you can make this profile with your Unreal Engine project open and looking at your MetaHuman. And by the way, um, just a little tip is you might want to decide if you're going to be making a cinematic with this. And if you're like when you're recording, kind of like test out different cameras, like have a camera set up, a Cinecam set up on your MetaHuman and saying like, you know what, I'm going to be shooting this with like a 30 or a 50, or I'm just going to go like close up, maybe have that camera you know set up while you're streaming in the data because if you're just looking at the data coming in to unreal just like in the ui without any kind of like mm -hmm. um special focus settings um you're really not going to see the mistakes until you're like looking at the data with the camera and you're like oh there's a mistake there or oh why is he doing this so yeah it really depends on what you're trying to capture but typically i only record um one capture and then I make it work. So I, I I rarely have to go back and let me redo this. I can always like get it as close as I possibly need it to be. And uh, it just depends on like how good you want it to look, so. Yeah, and I see you have somewhat of a studio set up behind you. So can you walk us through, you know, where the green screen comes into play? What are the necessary pieces of gear for you to do facial motion capture? And I think this is interesting too, because having worked with you before, I know you've started with just a DSLR camera, graduated to an indie head cam, and then now to the professional Mark IV. So it's a little bit of a tricky question, there are variations to the gear you use. So would love for you to walk us through that, some of the pros and cons of, you know, using a standalone versus high-end HMCs and what the full ecosystem looks like for your setup. Sure. Uh, I am having the Mark IV HMC is the cherry on top because it the helmet itself stays on your head. 
you can like move it around and you have the ability to like tighten it. Um, you can adjust the bar. And then the way the camera is mounted on it, you can move the camera. And inside of Facebook Studio, you have this really cool option on the bottom left where you can hit grid. And it literally has like a grid where you can see if like your face is perfectly framed. And it also has a light. And it also streams in 60 frames per second, which is amazing. Why do you want like those high frame rates being streamed in? Because you're giving Unreal like a whole lot of data to be able to pull from. And um, so that is the huge benefit of having the Mark IV HMC. And it's it's magic. Um, it's it's absolutely the fact that I can record, the fact that the HMC is integrated with the rest of the mocap equipment that I'm using has been like my dream come true. Um, so moving down, I'm gonna go backwards. Yep. So moving down to the Indie HMC. So it literally is a helmet with a GoPro attached to it. And it's a wide angle uh, GoPro. So if you are, um, you know, gonna be showing your GoPro footage to anyone you like, just don't expect a response back because it's a wide angle lens as close as possible to your face. And there isn't a light, but um, I did find a workaround. I have a little reading light that I just clipped on there just to light my face. So I started learning how to adjust the hardware mm -hmm. based on how my data was coming out. Cause I was like, hmm, you know what? I moved around when I was wearing that and the shadow, like how the light changed on my face kind of broke the, the tracking. Yep. I was like, oh, I, I might need to light my face better. Um, and I use the DSLR data for my short film for the fellowship. And um, I, I don't think I did any cleanup. Like I think with just the eyes, the sleep sequence where she wakes up, I, I animated the eyes where they're kind of like in a dream state, um, but that was the data. And then, so originally I started with DSLR footage. I have a camera that records, um, it can record up to 60 frames per second. Mm -hmm. And what I did was you have some sample data that um, is available on your website. And I got to see what the Mark IV data looks like. There's a really good one of Katarina Rodriguez, um, the purple dinosaur. So I looked at that and I was like, okay, how do I, what can I do to be able to get that without the HMC? This is how I started approaching mm -hmm. the idea. And I was like, she's not moving her head and her face is evenly lit. And I can't figure out what kind of lens it is. I'm like, so I'm gonna test a few. So I basically like set my camera facing me. I have an Elgato cam link that allows me to connect my camera into my computer so I can see it on my monitor. And I put some soft lights on each side of me and I did not move my head. I just like kept it still. Yes, you can get head and neck rotation, but if you're yeah. wearing professional HMC, like you're not getting that movement. So don't move your face, don't move your head, like just keep it as um, still as possible. And the way you position it, so like you don't want it all the way up here, you don't want it down here, you want yep. it like, just so like, you know, um, it's trial and error. And uh, yeah, you start with a really, really good neutral pose. And I've been using DSLR footage for like ever since I got, um, before I got the HMCs and it's great. Like I prefer looking at my face through a 50 millimeter, um, the 24 millimeter that I have, which actually <laughs> gives you much better data is hard to look at just because you have a 24 millimeter up in your face. So, um, but yeah, you, um, you can literally do it with, um, if you have a wide angle anamorphic lens, like you are good to go. And, um, Recording audio is also uh, something you want to take into account because if you're doing dialogue, you want to keep all your frame rates consistent. So um, just another little tip out there. Yeah. So in your video, you mentioned working with Norman Wang. I worked with him a couple of times over at Glassbox, a familiar friend of the company. And so I, I gather that most indies out there might not have their own Norman Wang. So can you walk us a bit through, you know, how you prepared the metahumans for work with facial emotion. How can they work with metahumans if they don't have their own Norman Wang or their own, you know, consultant to help them transfer this into Unreal? So the Motion Logic Blueprint is available to everybody. Now mm -hmm. you have it available on Facewares website. Um, <clears throat> Glassbox has it available on their website. It's the exact same blueprint. The only thing that's different 
is since uh, Faceware is now uh, offering a free LiveLink uh, plugin for 4.27, um, the way the Motion Logic Blueprint actually connects with Studio, that's essentially the only difference, um, yep. is just the way the Blueprint set up in order to receive information from Faceware. But the Motion Logic Blueprint itself is available to anyone. So um, that is something that, you know, both these companies have put in the hands of the uh, creators. So, um, yeah, cool. if you don't need, um, thanks to Norman Wang, you know, who like knows how to set these things up and utilize <laughs> metahuman poses and be able to integrate this in order to get the most uh, natural looking data. Um, the first time I ever saw what an intricate motion logic blueprint was, was uh, John McInnes has uh, Grace and Glassbox has a demo where Grace was actually the only character that I saw, like the most, so beautiful, that actually had blend shapes and could receive, uh, it was like a high quality rig that I was looking at and just admiring before MetaHumans came out. So, um, so yeah, so all you have to do is um, just follow the instructions. You have made it so simple for people to just import your MetaHuman, add the uh, Motion Logic Blueprint into your project, enable the plugin, open up Facewear Studio, whether you're streaming in webcam or you have, uh, you followed Nick um, Pixel Professor's um, video where he shows you how to connect an iPhone to um, Studio, which can then connect, you know, I mean, you can put any kind of input into Facewear Studio, as long as it's like RGB data. And there you are, you just, you know, hit calibrate and your data's coming in. That's That's how simple it is. I'm not like, you know, in like the matrix over here, like doing stuff, it's not possible. If it's easy for me to do, then anyone can do it. Yeah. So I saw you had a number of folks um, that worked with you throughout the video that you had, we had just showed earlier. So for other character artists that helped you out with your metahuman character, the design, bringing it all together, how did you motivate them to stay interested and committed to your project? I imagine there's a lot of folks out there, you know, trying to assemble their own dream team as well. So talk to us about your process working with these folks. So if anybody doesn't know who Fatty Bull is, Bernard Ryder, um, <laughs> I got some really good advice from him. He said, pulling together a team is very difficult, but a team of artists. And yes, we all have bills to pay, but um, if you can find collaborators whose style and work you admire, where they excel in certain areas that you don't, reach out to them, like just send an email, just say, hey, I like your work. Like reach out to people whose work you admire, give people credit. 90% of the time people just want credit. And mm -hmm. um, with, um, let's see, with Pixel Urge, who is an amazing 3D artist, um, we, how did we meet? We met from my Winbush webinar and I've looked at some of his work and I just kind of was like, hey, you mind kind of helping me with this? And he took so much time to like walk through like here, I'm this is how you do it in Blender. Cause I'm like, I, I'm useless outside of Unreal. So find people who excel in areas where you might not, and you might be excelling in an area where they might need your help later on. So creating that collaborative process, not only do I always tell them like, make it your own, because sometimes like my perspective might be limiting them in order mm -hmm. for them like make something amazing, like Daniel Kadina, who did the textures. I told him, I was like, I like Alita Vandal and Angel. I like, I sent him a few examples, but I'm like, I want you to make it your own. Just make it your own, just go crazy. And he delivered this like incredible look that she has. I mean, it's incredible. Then I reached out to Fatty Bull and I was like, hey, my lighting is like, he's like, yeah, it's flat. He's like, it's flat, you need help. So he spent time like walking me through how to light that Greek metahuman, which like, if you had seen the original without the lighting and then with, I was just like so happy. And then the fingers. Um, so this character has also been used by another Unreal artist. And I asked him, cause I watched his webinar. I, I, I cannot remember his name, but he's done like some amazing like uh, metahuman Unreal projects. And I asked him, I was like, did you have issues with this character's hands? And he's like, yeah, we had to re-rig it. So I asked my friend Constantine, the Lacrua, and he's made some of my favorite robot characters that I started out with, 
I was like, hey, would you mind taking a look at the fingers? Because the finger data that you um, have with your characters is always perfect. He re-rigged re the fingers for me. So all of this was a collaboration from people. And um, I'm so lucky. I asked VR Divisions, who I am like in love with his Unreal environments. I'm like, can you maybe make something based on this Pinterest board? And within like a day, he delivered, you know? So collaborating and if you're ever collaborating, always give people credit, like take mm -hmm. the time to give people credit, like put their names in there. Like I was like thinking, I'm like, should I? Absolutely. You know, because like, that's how we all grow, you know, is to like help each other move forward. Awesome. So I'm starting to see some questions come in about the, the creative process behind what some of what you're doing. So how do you deal with creative changes in dialogue, especially when there is a small part of the dialogue that needs replacing? Um, well, if you've seen the demos that I've done, they're really short. So I haven't really gone into like a full blown conversation. I haven't gone into like the deep Freudian, you know, therapist <laughs> conversation. So I can't really answer that. Um, yeah. I, I use what I have and I make it work. That is why I say that if you're, a, when you create something, that is when you learn. You, like, I just bang my head on the computer and I keep like hammering at it until I get it to do what I want it to do. You know, and then like after two weeks of like troubleshooting in my sleep and I've given up, then I'm like, let me try this. And then it works. Yeah. So don't don't give up. Like if you wanted to do something unreal, it's always something very simple in Unreal. It's always something simple. So Yeah. So interesting question. Have you ever studied animation principles to enhance facial performance? I know you recently did a webinar. Um with the, I, I forget what they're called, the fax team. Um, there's a fax person that you recently did a webinar on. So we have some questions on, have you studied animation principles? Have I studied it? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I know how to like retarget, extends data and uh, yeah. favorite data. But I've, had, I've had the opportunity to meet Arsene from Manus who taught me how to perfect the T-pose. So that wasn't me just like, oh, if I just zero everything out, I studied, I watched people who are really, really good at what they do already. And I pulled information that I knew was gonna be useful for my pipeline. Um, no, yeah. I studied psychology um, back like a while ago. And uh, my degree was actually in, uh, I, was, I was going into military psychiatry of all things. So when the recession happened uh, back in like 2009, I couldn't even get a job with my um, my fancy psychology degree. So I've basically been working in hospitality, like paying my bills and taking care of my mom. Um, and I just stumbled into this. So I don't have any background experience. I'm trying to learn about a uh, fax, facial action coding system. There are some incredible resources out there. Um, there's a great uh, website um, doing behavioral science uh, on YouTube. That's what I've been learning. Um, and I'm looking at getting some documentation to start uh, furthering, um, delving deeper into this because I love facial motion. Yeah, so I mean, working with you, it feels like you've been able to find a lot of just publicly available or online resources to kind of self-teach and also partner with folks to pick their brain on the best way to mocap onto a metahuman. That said, when you first started, had you ever considered working with a low-cost solution like an iPhone. What would you say is the biggest difference working with an iPhone versus like the face resolution? Uh, I actually bought an iPhone that I, it's not even my phone. I bought an iPhone so I could use it for virtual production, uh, which I'm still paying off. And um, I, I, <laughs> I got it so I could install, because I, I, I use an Android, and I yeah. got it so I could install the VCam uh, that Unreal has, and then I got to test out Dragonfly, and then I used it for UE Live Link Face. And I didn't really spend too much time with UE Live Link Face because the MetaHumans came out. Mm -hmm. I tested out Faceware. I actually have a video where I show UE Live Link Face data. It was the one right before I did the Faceware uh, Blueprint one, where I just learned that MetaHumans, uh, you can record one body animation and it works on all of them. And uh, then I did the same with the face. I was like, oh wow, you know, the faces are moving. But then as soon as I tried face wear, I was like, yeah, I'm not going back to UA Live Link face. <laughs> um, so, uh, so I haven't really spent too much time with it. Um, 
it's just that with UE Live Link Face, like the data comes in and you will get like, I believe like kind of like you could get overly exaggerated expressions. So like if you do like an O, oh, it's like the lips like like just stick together and like the mouth is just, there's nothing in between that data coming in that's kind of like filtering it. Although I've seen people be able to create like modifications to the actual UE Live Link blueprint in order to kind of adjust certain things coming in. But I'm I'm not that uh, I'm not that in depth with modifying blueprints. So yeah, um, you I have a question about Jonathan Winbush's course. Um, you mentioned his UE course. Um, did you have to get Cinema 4D to work through that? And I'm going to ask this at a high level because I'll be honest, I don't have too much context on Jonathan Winbush's course. <laughs> Okay, so Jonathan Wimbush released this course uh, on MoGraph.com. So it's told, it's taught from like a motion graphics background. So like I, I again, I just learned like the Andrew Kramer um, beginners After Effects and understanding that how it works, how a composition is created, and all that stuff. Um, I did not know how to use Cinema 4D, and I got really frustrated when I installed it. I, I was like, I, I can't do this. And he's like, no, 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 no. He's like, just, just try it, just try it. Like I messaged him on like Instagram and he's like, no, 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 don't give up. So I took the course and I, I, I was like having so much fun going through the course. Like he literally teaches it to you like you're like a three-year-old, which is exactly what I was a year ago. And I kept looking at that Cinema 4D section and I was like, oh gosh, like I really love this course and I don't want to have to like skip that part. So I get to that part of the, uh, class and i i did it i was like using cinema 4d and he like literally shows you exactly what you got to press and i absolutely loved that 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 software so awesome. uh, yeah so i have a couple questions coming in on frame weight frame, frame rates um i understand the reason for streaming at 60 frames per second so you can have more frames and face to solve from however is there any benefit to recording 60 frames per second um because there's some folks here who are setting their take recorder to 24. um so yeah share uh, let us know if you have any insight on that the question is is there any benefits also recording the data at 60 fps versus lower fps um you know what um take recorder you can try to force take recorder to like up sample to like 60 frames per second but uh, what are you trying to accomplish? And I just leave take recorder at default. I've tried to like force it to like bring in my data, like to record in Unreal, the actual recording at 60 frames per second. I was able to do it with sequence recorder, which is like done. Um, but no, you want the data coming in to be high. So when you're recording it, like Unreal is like, you know, still using that data. For example, if I bring in a body animation from Xsense, okay, and Xsense records at 240 hertz frame rates, like that's a whole lot of data, right? And you press play, you know, in sequencer, and you see the animation, it looks like it's playing like normally, you know? The data will definitely be smoother when you're recording it at that, but I, mm -hmm. I typically like leave the body data at like 120. Um, and then in uh, all of my sequences are, 24 frames per second. So I just make sure that the actual sequence is 24 frames per second. If I'm doing something in slow-mo and I'm still using a face animation that I recorded at 24 frames per second, if the actual data that came in is really, really good, then no, I don't think it matters. But I, I'm not an expert, so I don't know. No worries. Um, let's see, we have some questions on re-rigging the metahuman. When you re-rig a metahuman, do you lose all the advantages of using the Unreal Skeleton for them? Re-rigging. So, because the only software I use besides the mocap softwares is Unreal Engine, um, I am not a rigger. I have never rigged. I did rig for like a month in Maya just to like learn how, but I have no idea. However, <laughs> Um, for riggers that are interested, there are actually uh, some really amazing resources out there for people that are rigging. What I can suggest, based on what I've seen, is um, first of all, what software are you using? And secondly, uh, you don't want to disconnect the metahuman from the post process. So I, I do think that 
you have to do some tests. Like there's no like magic solution. You have to test this. You have to like try a few things. You want to like import the new modified thing and um, you want to make sure you assign it to the original skeleton. But I don't really know what kind of modifications you're doing. So I, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> um, question on audio. Where is the audio being recorded? How are you managing audio takes? Oh, okay. So I have my DSLR camera and I got, um, I just got, um, I just had a lav mic attached to my camera. I just got a wireless one and I'm just recording my um, camera data. Like my always use a reference video. Like if you can and you're doing a performance that doesn't require you to be like hopping around a room. If you can like get some, um, some video reference of your face or use the video reference of your face when you're um, working with it, you know, use that to like, like do a few blinks. Um, the clap is really important. Um, so I just record my data in my DSLR. I convert that audio file to a wave and then just drop it into Unreal. And yeah, use those markers, like do a clap, do a hard blink or something so that you can see that and then say something so that you can just sync your audio very simply. Cool. Um, question on VR headsets. Have you tried mocap with VR headsets and Vive base stations? Oh, that's awesome. Actually, I am. I, I got a Valve Index, and uh, I'm still trying to figure out how not to get uh, motion sick from like forced locomotion. However, <laughs> um, I just saw that Man has released these new gloves, which I'm. Really oh, I just saw them at GDC. And, they are great. <laughs> And the person who told me, like the person that I found out about VR mocap solutions is Matt Workman, who had a blog on it uh, before I actually like, you know, knew what I was doing. So I have asked to see if I can test out the Manus full body motion capture solution um, called Polygon with their new trackers. And I do have the setup to do it. Like I just don't have as many uh, trackers. So I've got four base stations. I have uh, one Vive tracker. <laughs> and uh, just got the controllers so you kind of need a bunch of other trackers but i've seen the results for the polygon um in unreal with metahumans it's actually really really good so i'm excited to see what this is going to look like in ue5 because moving forward everything's going into five cool um do you still use cinema 4d and anything for your pipeline um, fortunately, I just couldn't afford paying the cinema <laughs> subscription because I was I, I was just spending all my time in Unreal. So yeah, even if I had another software that I was subscribed to, I don't use it. Like I'm in Unreal Engine like eight to ten hours a day, so yeah. I don't have time. I might open up Blender, like if someone sends me a file and they're like, "Whoa, it's like something's not working" or whatever, or if I'm trying to figure something out, I'll use Blender, which is free to just import my data and see what's going on in there, you know, and then that's it. Everything else is unreal. Yeah. So I gather that you, you definitely um, have a more, a, a larger focus working in unreal. Um, was that always the original goal? Um, I guess in terms of like what you're trying to go for, uh, where's the question? Um, what kind of roles would you like to play? What, I guess, what is your end goal here working with Unreal Engine? I know you originally started off just kind of testing things out and seeing where this journey would kind of take you. So I'm kind of curious, um, what's next for you in the future? Uh, the next plan is um, to move my entire pipeline to Unreal Engine 5 with mm. all of the animation tools, with Lumen. Um, I want to redevelop my entire MetaHuman motion capture pipeline I feel like I figured it out and I'm really happy with it now that it's working in like 4.26 and 2.7. Um, and there's a few things with like some of the plugins that kind of need to be tweaked in 4.27. However, with five, that is where I feel like we're all starting over. We're all starting yeah. new. There are no, there's nobody who's like better than another yeah. person. And I really like that because I love learning and I love spending time in Unreal and I love hitting walls. And I love finding solutions to problems. I love that moment when you're like, you're ready to give up and then it works. And you're like, oh my God, like, like, oh, I'm such a nerd, but I just love it. <laughs> um, and also because 
it's taken me so long to like learn this pipeline. And I've had people like Jonathan and people in the Discord community and all the people in the fellowship, like I'll hit up um, a few people on there, you know who you are, Diana, Gabriel. So um, I wanna help other people follow, you know, in in my steps, if you can. Um, yeah say that um i'm like i'm sure a lot of people who are entering this world probably have a background in maya and all these things if you do you're like way ahead of me so you're, you're gonna just like fly past me but um i want to help other people get to uh, where i am and and in order to do that i am preparing to be releasing everyone's been asking about this uh facial motion cleanup i want to do it in unreal engine 5 and that's why i haven't like released anything yet so I want to help others, just like I have been helped by this amazing community. So I want to give back, and I also want to uh, be able to create, you know, and tell stories. And I know you have a big YouTube presence. Um, you have your own YouTube channel, Feeding Wolves. Are there any other creators that you're currently paying attention to, those that inspire you, those that... Um, I guess help you help you further your education in the virtual production space. Oh, that's a tough one. Um, Cause I feel like the list could go on forever. Yeah, there's, <laughs> a lot, there's a lot. Um, I love what Corey Strausberger is doing with uh, Xanadu. I, so to narrow it, whoever is using MetaHumans, whoever's using them, like whatever you're doing with them, I'm looking for your content. I want to see what other people are able to create with MetaHumans. So for anyone utilizing MetaHumans, I might not remember you and I don't want to leave you out, um, but I am watching your content. I'm looking for it. I'm actively searching to see how far we can all get, you know what I mean? With regards to like body and facial performance on these like high fidelity characters, because they're not the easiest to work with if you don't know what you're doing. So, mm -hmm. um, like, um, so yeah, there's a few people out there. Um, and just a heads up, there is a guy named, I think, I think you pronounce it, Joe, Joe, Joe Bochu. Um, he's been doing all these amazing Unreal 5 retargeting. Oh, yes, him. So, you know, he's like my hero right now. And Gabriel Paiva, um, I wish I could remember his YouTube channel because he's amazing. Um, he's from the fellowship. He is like the metahuman uh, whisperer. So, um, and I, he just got a YouTube channel. So I have to, um, I'd like to find the link to that. But, um, but yeah, those are, those are some people I look up to that I'm always learning from. Yeah, so we're gonna start to jump back and forth. We have some technical coming, technical questions still coming in. So when we're recording live from Facebook in Take Recorder, you often get a lot of pre and post roll because Take Recorder doesn't sync with Faceware. Is there a way to trim a recorded animation sequence so that it matches the length of the reference video? Can you say that one more time? Because I'm yeah. trying to like, like that was a, that was a whole lot. I so. know. When recording live from Faceware, um, Take Recorder, you often get a lot of pre and post roll because Take Recorder doesn't sync with Faceware. Is there a way to trim a recorded animation sequence so that it matches the length of the reference video? Yes, there totally is. So um, what you can do, I was literally just learning this just the other day. So locate, okay, if you're using audio, right? Or if this mm -hmm. person's using audio, okay. Um, you wanna locate the syncs, first of all. Now, if your recording is like super long and you're like having to drag it and drag it and drag it, okay. So here's what you can do. Um, you can right click on the audio or the facial animation and go to edit and then hit split and then you're you're good to go. And then let's say you're like moving that audio track into like a new sequence and you're like, oh, what frame was that on where I set the M and the eyes blinked and that's kind of like what my um, my sync is. Find the audio. Okay, you have to like kind of figure it out. That's why you do that clap so you can see like that big jump in um, the wave. And mm -hmm. yeah, trim it. And once you do the trim, it's super easy. And uh, also if you right click on the audio, it has like a start frame rate so that I just write it down and I'm like, oh, you know what? I um, I remember like I do the clap at, um, you know, 1033, you know, and that's, I'll write it down if I'm in another project and I'm like, oh, that's where I need to like start my sequence, you know, audio track. So yeah, like, you know, I'm figuring it out. Mm -hmm. But these are really good questions that I would love to include in like, you know, uh, yeah, your masterclass, right? <laughs> um, 
So because you were previously in the Unreal Fellowship, are there any suggestions or advice you can share on how to get into the next Unreal Fellowship cohort? We have a follow-up question on Epic Mega Grants, but in my mind, I can't remember if you've been granted an Epic Mega Grant. <laughs> no, I have not. Um, I have not received a Mega Grant. And as far as entering the fellowship, I don't know. Like, I don't know. Uh, the fact that I got in, I was like, I'm not going to ask any questions. So <laughs> I, I'm not sure how to answer that because I literally don't know. So yeah. I'm sorry. Everybody asks me to. Like, I'm like, oh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's quite all right. Um, so it seems some of, some of these questions may have been answered already in the video we showed at the beginning, but there are some folks who want to get a better understanding of what is what what Face for Studio is capable. So is Studio um, for live capture only or can you use pre-recorded videos? Yeah, no, I started with like pre-recorded videos. Uh, I was not using my webcam. Let's put it that way. I wanted really, really good data. <laughs> And um, I like to record my data first. I like to have my body and facial data captured in an actual like video file. And then like when I take off the all the gear, cause like with the gloves, if you've ever tried to like WSD with the gloves, mm -hmm. it's not easy. Um, and then operating the mouse and then like, you know, the, the bar on the HMC, you could like knock things over. So I like to capture my data. Um, and then when I'm like, you know, I'm like danger free. I can sit down and I can focus on like, okay, I made that, I made that, I did that wrong. Let me make this profile. And then I'm like, okay, I'm really happy now. I'm gonna go ahead and stream this data in and record it now. So um, definitely start with pre-recorded data, test mm -hmm. out different lenses. Um, and also if you're gonna be collaborating, like uh, I see a lot of people working with UE Lightning Face and they're not able to get that data into Unreal. They're using a C CSV file. Um, if you already have a video of your face, it could literally be like a phone video. You're not gonna get the best data, but like you want it positioned in a way so that you can get as close to the best data as possible. Um, you can collaborate with people across the world. If like they are like, hey, I need your voice and your performance. Um, you can send them a video file with the audio and uh, the face and you can go ahead and put their performance in you know so if you're working remotely absolutely like that's that's amazing so definitely you can work i i use it a lot offline you know for cinematics and stuff mm -hmm. like i i am not a vtuber i am not streaming in live data and streaming it on like twitch so i want to take my time and get the best possible performance out of the data so i use pre-recorded yeah yeah have you worked with other faces besides your own like an old person or someone who has a less classical face structure? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I've actually had some people send me face data, which is like kind of weird when you're like, you've got like, you're so personal when you're like, you have a, a video of somebody's face up close. Um, yeah, I've worked with, with different uh, faces. Um, the beards are a little tricky. And if you wear mm -hmm. glasses, take the glasses off, you know? Um, but um, yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I've worked with various faces, which is fun. That's how I started. I started pulling stuff off of like um, stock footage websites and just like zooming in on the face um, and finding that like that like neutral pose on them. That's a little tough. Um, yeah. But you'll also kind of want to experiment um, with whether your meta human face matches the the. That's kind of what I'm delving into next. I really want to know if. I can recreate a face. Okay, let's say I recreated my face. And let's say I smile a certain way and like, you know, certain certain features are visible. And my meta human looks identical to me, okay? Are our expressions gonna look the same is my question. So I'm like slowly kind of like trying to get into that mindset to see if I am any good at sculpting a face in order to see if the data looks the same. But um, I don't know if I'm going to be successful. I am not the best at the creator or sculpting faces. So, um, yeah. Yeah. So we are at the five minute warning. So my last final question that I want to give you the floor on is what are the things that you are working on um, next? I know you shared a little bit with me. I'd love for you to let people know about the upcoming projects you have in the works. 
So um, the pipeline that I currently have, my MetaHuman motion capture pipeline, and utilizing all of the tools that I'm using, um, I've pretty much got it all figured out in 4.26. I want to redevelop it in 5, utilizing all of the new tools. I want to see if like the tools in 5 will get me even better results. And I want to release a like full-on masterclass for people that will be available to everybody. Um, and you know, if they can utilize the trial licenses, I'd love to provide some sample data and see what people can create. I just, I, I, I love the like feeding that, like feeding wolves is like feeding like the good wolf, which is like <laughs> others, you know? So I really wanna see what the community creates based on this information and knowledge that I would be sharing. And I also cannot wait to like start working on my short film again, because um, yeah, I've kind of strayed with uh, everything, but I'm really excited to like start working on the script again and just like, you know, like being a stay at home filmmaker. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that masterclass is something that a lot of artists are going to be looking forward to. Um, we often, as a salesperson, we often get a lot of questions on how do you integrate all of these different workflows into their one pipeline. And so I think having this masterclass is gonna be a game changer for a lot of folks looking to integrate Manus, Accents, face, wear, face, body, hands. So um, that said, we look forward to working with you on this masterclass to come in UE5. That said, I think we're just about uh, out of time. Thank you, Gabby, for um, joining with joining us on this webinar. And we'll continue to share more information on Gabby's upcoming projects and also this upcoming masterclass. And also stay tuned. Uh, we have Simon Habib up next for our upcoming webinar in April. I don't have a hard date for you guys yet. Um, so that said, uh, we're gonna we're gonna plan on that upcoming. He just presented at a uh, GDC, um, so we're gonna work with our marketing team to plan that out in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody.